beep beep what is up guys my name is sam world and i'm here with soul and don't blink and today we're going to be doing an interview with them where they're going to be showing us one of their biggest tracks called vibrations how are you guys yeah thanks for having us we're doing great checking in from bali we're going to break down our track vibration today for you guys and uh obviously a big track of ours uh came out end of last year on cinco swim made it all the way to the top of beatport and back down i guess at some point <laughs> But the way up is always fun. Baseline. Awesome, guys. So first off, the first thing I see here is Bidwig. Can you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about this software? Sure. Uh, it's, as if we're going to break down the project, we're going to look on the details. What's actually the difference between what makes this a doll unique? And first things, I think this thing which I think in Ableton, it just looks like that, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. In Bitwig, you actually can just uh, have it here, which is uh, which is cool. You can just store your like jam samples here, and then you just can audition him, and then just put it on the project. It's like easy. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I know in Ableton, we have the scene. So would you guys say it's like when you start a track, you usually start in in I guess you would say the scenes, like you jam out and then from there you arrange the track or? So the way how we start, we're usually, we're not using Bitwig as a starter. We use a machine, a standalone. Oh, okay. We have a controller here. So uh, we we usually like work on the groove, like on foundation first. Once it's just relentless, then we just open it as a plugin in the Bitwig and start arranging the track and just put some ideas on top and see how it works. You know? Pretty much the, the, the... The idea for us is to make a, a loop that is relentless. So basically, the moment we have a groove that just keeps on grooving, that's uh, that's a good foundation right there because then it just keeps going. And then we we assign some filters uh, so we can play around on a controller, put a, like a low pass filter in, and then kind of just some basic effects. So and then we're usually standing here and just freaking dancing to it. Or <laughs> uh, as we talked about earlier, we put on like a, a YouTube video of Zolardo playing Cream Fields or whatever and full screen and just in, oh. envision playing the track out and see if it would work right for a crowd it's a bit weird but it works <laughs> yeah. that's that's a big thing though ain't it like you hear your track in, in bitwig and it kind of like me but when you put like a youtube video attached to it like people dancing then you yeah. kind of feel more of the magic of it 100 yeah, yeah. Man, that's that's a great tip I, I think not a lot of people do it visualizing and then just having that usually exactly. yeah, sometimes what i'll do is uh so i'll pretend to dj it as i'm making it up to the drop and if it like feels <laughs> fulfilling when it comes in then you know you got you know you got something going on standing in front of your wall going like Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> you know obviously you, you guys are hitting the drum pad do you guys quantize it or do you try and keep a little bit of that humanization the human error of not landing directly on the beat inside of a machine yeah it's, it's quantized pretty much the input is quantized so Every okay. time you the press, it's 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 already in sync, uh, which is which is which is great. You always you kind of not missing the key. So and then you can just shift the notes if you like have a more swing or not. So mm. yeah, we tend to use the quantize all the time. That's sick. Can you uh, set the swing inside machine, or do you or do you do that somewhere else? When you're yeah, it, it, has really, it, it has really good swing. Usually we, I don't know why this project doesn't have a swing. We usually we put like thirty percent. On every track yep. so the swing which just makes this groove kind of you know funky in a way so i yeah. see uh, uh back where it says vibration groove you've got pattern one pattern one pattern one pattern two so i assume that's how you're arranging it what's your guys thoughts on uh variations to keep it interesting like that so the groove is just really, uh, it's really endless. The variations comes from the, the other sounds, which is already in the project, which is usually we use like call response sounds, mm -hmm. which just makes the difference and keep this interest. Uh, but the groove is always there. Even on the breakdowns, we just filter it. We're not taking any elements from the groove. We just filter it. Well, he's talking about the patterns as well. So yeah, during the groove, when we oh, make yeah. the grooves, there's certainly patterns where we just maybe shift the bass line or, or just try different things. But ultimately, it usually turns out that like, two or three patterns work really well. And the others are just like, as Alex said, there's usually just one groove running in the background. And then we we drag out the samples that we really like or the sounds that we really like. 
and move them into the into the library so that we can take them from there. So when you when you're building up your group, do you I mean do you start you usually start with the kick or 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 the drums or do you go for like sort of kick, open hat, clap, or what's yeah. your sort of method? Yeah, usually it's a kick in the in the in the bass and then we're adding some uh, one shots. And, and some loops and see what works. We just move around the bass lines, move around the one shots and see which fits, which is the perfect combination of the of the elements. When the when the all the sounds working all together, then we move to the next stage, which is opening yeah. Bitwig and start arranging the track. Okay, so do you guys want to show us a little bit of the project inside of Bitwig? Uh seeing like probably the bass sure. and the arrangement of it? So the bass line is it's just the MIDI, right? So we we usually make uh, different variations of patterns in uh, in a bitwig. Then we export it as a wave, and then open up in machine. And then, so we have uh, two tracks here uh, of the bass line right now. I'm trying to solve them. So basically, it's a kick in the bass here. Uh, and th those blocks are just the MIDI notes, right? So we have one sound just goes to here, and then another which just kind of responds, right? And usually with machine, we can just move around the notes here. This original. Uh, I mean, it's not a record science. It's just uh, just one shot. So we just like we have thousands of one shots, and then what's what's clap and what's snare fitting the groove, and yeah, mm. there's no magic. You have to like go through all your sample libraries. Yeah. And just find which which what works. So when it comes to sound selection, you guys just put stuff until something fits and sounds kind of how you want it to. Yeah. yeah. When it comes yeah. to making bass lines, um, do you guys have any tips on what creates a, a captivating bass? So basically we have this plugins called uh, spam. Spam, right? Yes. You can see where you pick and where your bass line is. And usually we have the bass line like around this section. But with the square is usually somewhere here, right? With the mm -hmm. with the with the soft tube, you can have wider range. So it just occupies more frequencies, more nicer. Yeah. Nice. So all the all, all bass lines is like a soft tube bass, uh, soft tube waveform. I'll ask you a quick question here with span, because I've I've always taught people this, and I, I want to see what you guys think yeah. about it. Uh, yeah. So usually when I'll get people asking how loud should my bass be, et cetera, where should it be at? I always show them span and I always tell them negative mm -hmm. 30 on that or just the number 30. So if you bring it up, that seems to be where yeah, most, exactly. most bass lines, right, seem to land in every single track that I've referenced when it comes to Tech House Big Room. Do you think that's a good kind of way to see it when it comes to just yeah. leveling your bass? I agree. We always go with uh, minus 30. It's basically kicking the bass always here. I mean, I mean, yeah, it's not... Well, we turned down the master. Yeah, we turned down it. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything in particular about the way you mix the bass uh, to the kick? Uh, did you guys have issues with that? And if you did, what do you guys usually do to kind of get them to fit? So usually we, the tool is just handy. It's just equalizer. Just cut the 50 and see maybe more and more 55, and see when it yeah. start breathing we're not collapsing and obviously side chain okay i mean we usually the we use the slight compression yeah between, on that group yeah i mean we use the lfo, the LFO, tool. LFO tool right you know, basically yeah. lfo boys uh, that's the one no bottom <laughs> <cheaper. Easy. laughs> nah. um so when you're <laughs> setting that side chain up um, do you look at the response of the kick, how long the kick is, uh, how long it's lasting, or do you usually just go for yeah. up to the halfway? So we cut the kick here awesome. all the time, right? So yeah. it's one eight, uh, one one eight, right? So basically, mm -hmm. this is the the base, this is the kick. So we give the space. The the kick has never been a lot. I mean, we don't we have we use the short kicks, right? So this is the maximum. Yeah, oh. yeah up to the halfway, the point three. When it comes to the kick and the base, another thing that I guess people have is that they'll pick a kick and a bass. Do you think there's an instance where the kick and bass will never get along because it's just the wrong kick or or it's just the wrong bass? Yes. Yeah, of course. We we sometimes search around projects at the very end and try to find a better kick or try to find a better yeah, usually it's a kick that that, that makes a difference. Uh I it's very good to have some trusty kicks, to be honest, yeah. um, because once you know that certain kicks are working in a club and they're punching through, they're not too, 
too woody, they're not too clicky, and they're, uh, they're, they're, they're like nice and round and give you like the, the punch that you want and the low end that you want, and that's a kick that you should keep. Doesn't work on every bass, for sure not, and also it depends a little bit maybe on the key of the, of the bass, for mm -hmm. sure. So then, yeah, you can just see. You guys, yeah. um, when you guys are making sounds, do you tend to do use a lot of digital plugins or do you use hardware? Do you have sort of an opinion on a preference between those two? Uh, we don't have any hardware. I mean, we have a lot. Of, <laughs> we have a lot of controllers, which I have a <laughs> museum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Alex uh, notoriously collects controllers and then doesn't use them. I can. I just. I cannot pass by a new yeah. controller. I just. I, Someday I'm gonna build a village house. <laughs> With the bass out of the way, I think a good tech house track needs to have a proper arrangement in order to increase the energy, bring it down. Do you want to run us through how you guys arrange this track and talk about some of the decisions you made throughout it? Sure, sure. So once the groove is done, right? So we um, we open machine as a plugin here, and then uh, we start uh, like adding things. So on the top here, you kind of see the arrangement, right? So the green is uh, it's a breakdown, the, the, the red is the, is the drop, right? Mm -hmm. There's basically okay. filter, filter machine, filter the lower end, essentially. Yeah. So there's an automation on machine. Maybe we can open the automation. There's a lot of automation, yeah. actually. Nice. Of automation, yeah. I guess. But that, that happens later when, when we actually know the arrangement. At the beginning, it's mostly about finding other sounds as well that work. We would like to use the technique, which is call response, right? One sound is calling, the other one's responding. OK. Uh, I mean, uh, we're adding like sounds to just to go along with the groove, right? We, it, everything should like based on the groove. It's not interferes with the groove, right? So we're trying to like implement it more and more. So everything like like calling and responding. So the, and the, then the track start working, mm -hmm. like start breathing. And so. you don't want to overdo that either. Uh, with vibration, it's it's actually really clean. Like all the sounds are pretty like well considered. Because that's, uh, that's, I think, if your groove doesn't work so well, it's very common right now that people are slapping way too many effects on everything. So literally anything, any gap, little gap that you have, suddenly people need to throw in claps and throw in like, like risers yeah. and everything. And that's not really like what we want to do. Because if you, have a, if you have a cool sound that can develop throughout the track, then do that instead, you know, and then you actually reuse it instead of like doing a random ass sound every freaking other drop, you know, it doesn't make so much sense. How do you guys usually develop? Is it mainly going to be like maybe opening up the, the cutoff or or like the pattern or is it like adding noise? Like how do you guys keep that sound interesting throughout? I mean, yeah. we, we use this thing a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we're making sounds and we just open it here. So it's basically a slicer. Mm hmm. Uh, and then you can just like organize your slices here pretty much the way you want it. Also, they you have can randomize it. Yeah. They randomize it. Let's uh, play this so people understand. Yeah, we need to put this. Oh, wait. And the, the, this is how it sounds right now, right? So randomize it. We usually like extend a little bit. Uh, we delete it. We just put it on on one, and then. then and then we just find to trying to find the you know interesting pattern, I guess, right? So yes. we, we we turn off the some. I mean, I mean, this is like you have to like try things here, right? Mm -hmm. Which just works. And then we when we do that, we end up with this one sound here with this pattern. Well, and again, we just basically we can just drag it from Egoist and drag it into uh, into the, the the library here. So then we can basically just place them however we want in the order that we want them. Yeah. So awesome. basically, this is we we make a different patterns in in Egoist, and then we just export it here, and then yeah. we're trying to like put it on a project and see what works better, right? Once this pattern is like ends, the new pattern. Is Yeah. I guess we can't 
talk about this part here. So we, we use this thing here, which is free. We can just download it for free. And, and, and amazing synth. I mean, I, I don't know. Only if... Alex understands this synth. <laughs> to be <laughs> <honest. what> <laughs> I mean, for me, this is the synth you can create any sounds. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you know, I know, I know you guys are using the serum, but I, I personally use uh, search for everything which I I need to make, like from any sound. So this 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 sounds we uh, I made like from the scratch. And then we can. Yeah, yeah. It's, so it's quite simple. Would I guess, you say? Um, would you say you're still using the synth to this day on m some of your m current releases that have came out within the past year? One hundred percent. Yeah. What What do you, What can you do? You feel like you can do in this that you can't do in in Serum, for example? What's the advantages of this synth? Uh, well, for me personally, it's it's a lot of um, module models here, which is a bunch of L4s. Different shapes. Uh, I mean, can you can create your own shape here. Uh, I mean, I know yeah. a lot of scenes can do that, but I mean, it, it's just I know it, it's it's, it's, it's here in, in yeah. everything, you know. And I, I have to uh, jump in here because it's literally if we need a sound in a certain frequency range, Alex like takes two yeah. minutes and he he creates that sound or at least something close, and then we can we can play around with it. So. Uh, he, he just knows the synth in and out pretty oh, much. Yeah. So whatever you know, it's usually the best plugin to use exactly. anyway. Yeah, so. and uh, it's it's just amazing. Like a feedbacks here, it just can roll the the filters here. It has two filters. Uh, it, it's just a, a bunch of effects, and it's really compact. You know, in everything mm -hmm. in front of your eyes. And I think this is like perfect synth. Yeah. Cool. So going back to arrangement, um, when yeah. executing the buildups. Um, is there like what do you have in your builds would you say obviously you need uplifter snare builds and stuff can you walk us through like a little bit of the process uh we have a groups which is always there so we have a foundation which is groove right machine here on top the rhythm then some extra tops uh vocals groups the texture and the effects so we, all those groups are always there in the project right we're just trying to like Make an order so we can just read the project. Mm -hmm. Snare rolls, the the lasers, the <laughs> well, lasers, and the, the. Well, it's true though that it's uh, like with the effects, we don't like, for example, just like sim my turn sample and also the lasers. We use them in a lot of tracks, and yeah. then somehow like you can tell that it's our production because you hear that little laser sound or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and and it works really well, right? Um, and which is cool about Vidic, I don't know, can you do it in Ableton? So if you like start a new project. So basically, you can just drag your group into new project like that, and it's it's here. So we can just open any project with uh, oh, like wow. any group, okay. all, and basically we just drag and drop all the effects, right? Yeah. Sometimes we just <laughs> change the pitch of them. So uh, do you have like sort of templated uh, projects when you open a new project where you've already populated it with certain sounds and textures and synths, or do you just start from clean every time? So we start clean usually from machine, but then we have a kind of like some some projects thing around where there's just like ideas or sounds. It's like a like like almost like a library kind of project that we can just go in and try to pick stuff from. So uh, and oftentimes it's just unused sounds from like old projects that just didn't work out where we still like the sounds. So then we we basically just move them all into a library project, and then uh, we can potentially use them in another in another project, right? Because clearly not every not every track is going to work out and not every track is going to get released. Um, and sometimes it just doesn't click so well, but there's still some cool sounds in there. So then it's nice to just like kind of like, it's like a little archive, you know, of, of mm -hmm. our sounds that, that we feel like have a lot of potential because then otherwise they just get lost and, and you just never use them again, right? So, so how, do you, how do you decide when you're doing a, a build? How do you decide when it's sort of done? You know, and you you put enough in that build, and you've built enough energy. Do you do you look for something to say, okay, that's enough, that's that's good? Yeah, it depends. At the moment, we're a little bit more cautious about like not going way too high energy because ultimately DJs are using effects as well doing doing buildups. So you don't even need to like put too many risers and stuff like this. And then it's a little bit of a case by case basis. To be fair, if you if we uh, with this track because it's a way more of like a groover. 
we don't necessarily want to make like the craziest of builds because we know that we're going to drop it pretty dry again. And uh, so then it basically it's just a groove coming back in. So if you have a really, really big build up with like a lot of like drum rolls and, and a lot of risers, then you basically your drop needs to like hold up and either use a lot of effects or like, I don't know, like really pick up the energy a lot. So we, we certainly have tracks like these as well, where it's like a really like peak time, like go all out. But vibration in this case is more of like a, a quite an interesting breakdown actually. Uh, again, call and response, and then build it up, and then just drop it again, and it's it's fun, right? So it's a great tip, I think. You know, yeah, so a, a lot of people just <laughs> go all out on builds, no matter like the context of the song, right? And then they wonder why the drop doesn't. It, it sounds anticlimactic, <laughs> I guess, right? It's the it's the perfect way to say it. Too anticlimactic. Yeah. So yeah. What's your guys' views on on vocals? Obviously, with a lot of your tracks, you, you tend to keep the vocals quite simple. Do you have sort of a, a, a thoughts on how and when to use them and to make your songs sort of sound like don't blink tracks? Well, first up, first up, we like to use strong ideas. That's like the main thing. If if, if we there, there's like quite a few like vocals that we start to use, and then they are like you cannot really hear what the person is saying or they just don't work out. So we try to find a lot. Like we, we look on YouTube, we look on other places and just see if there's cool phrases that we can use. Uh, one thing that's working out for us very, very well. And I think uh, in this track is also the case where you have a call and response between a, a male and a female vocal. So it's actually a girl saying baseline and then a guy saying vibration, right? So uh, so then that, that kind of feels cool in a club because yeah. then that's kind of like encompassing everyone in a way. Sometimes I just listen to the track and see what kind of like pops up in your head. Like, uh, you know, this track was based like based on the baseline. It was like, how about we shine something related to that? And then awesome. we come across some some YouTuber like talking about it was like a big box, bo big boxer, right? The guy. Oh yeah. And then we yeah. just we download the his beatbox, we break it down in a in a, in a sampler. Two steps. And then vibration. And then we Base. find cool snippets from that video, and then we just place it over the project, and oh. that was the idea. Yeah. So this is all like from so, a YouTube snip. Yeah, yeah, this this is YouTube. Wow. All those sounds he's making is just his voice. Oh right? wow, there you go. Sampling Sorry. off the YouTube. That's well, that is that is just a, a one-time occurrence, but it's certainly helpful if you have a cool idea. Just look for mm -hmm. look. Uh, YouTube is usually a great source because yeah. Splice for us is a little bit like overused, I think. Right? Yeah. It's it's just like if you find a cool vocal there chances are someone already used that and then it's really not like standing out right so, so. yeah the big race who's whoever gonna go first yeah and there's a lot of stories behind big track uh, big tracks for example like john uh john, john summit, summit mm -hmm. yeah and uh deep like it's like deep deep end track right? like, yeah. Yeah, but in, I guess. <laughs> yeah because they all use this like um deep end vocal right and then yeah. black v-neck made a track at the same time and then ultimately they released it as an official remix for john summit because he almost like claimed that vocal already beside it being already like it's it's actually a royalty free sample right so yeah um but that's the reason why yeah I mean, we're obviously running our own label as well, and there's so many samples I just recognize, and then I, I'm not, we're not interested in signing these tracks, because why would you sign something that has been done before, and it was big before, and it just feels yeah. like a ripoff, you know? And then also for us as artists, why would we just copy someone else or whatever? So um, there, certainly it's always a bottleneck finding good ideas. Like mm -hmm. it's not so simple. Um, we have another track that came out this year, Connection, which was actually the Bluetooth speaker from our friend. And we sampled it by just recording it in Ibiza when we were there, right? And it says like waiting for connection or something like this. And then obviously that's a cool theme already where you then you can maybe like do some beep sounds mm -hmm. or like some something mm -hmm. about a connection, right? And then immediately it works out, right? So you have an yeah. idea that is strong that is, and, and that makes a track. It gives the track the name and that gives the track kind of the... Uh, the recognizable factor if you listen to it in a club because if it's just a groove that's this other thing that we're seeing is a lot of like tech house guys are great at building awesome grooves and it's fun to play these tracks in a set but they just don't stand out so much right and then they, it, it just doesn't go so like so it only goes so far if you make good grooves i think just to go back to the to the project i think um just any we talked about the kick and the bass quite a lot but any tips on on um how you mixed and handled the tops, like the hats and the claps and the percussion. 
uh, this plugin we're using a lot. I mean, uh, it, it has like two two knobs which you like can tweak, which is like attack and sustain. Uh, yeah, we, we tend to use this plugin a lot. I mean, either we can just reduce the attack, or uh, it has even automation on that. So the, yeah, m mainly if your percussions are like too taking up too much space in the mix, then you can use that to like give it either more attack to make it more snappy or to reduce the sustain so that it doesn't go so long, right? And that's nice to give a bit more room in the in the mix. Sounds uh, the parts down, which is the tail down. So, yeah. yeah, so the sustain goes down. So basically, it served the compressor effect, mm -hmm. basically. Okay. So this this plug this 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 thing we're using like if we want to, if we use the compressor I guess right so to, so, to give the attack or just this attack or just bring the the lot the, the, the quiet parts up or bring them down that's it yeah do you tend to sort of saturate your uh, drum bus or EQ it do you, do you tend to, to use either of those two on your drum bus yeah we can uh, look at other I mean we we do use this ill echo quite a lot <laughs> yeah this, <laughs> this is from a film studio right. Yeah, that, that's from that. The funny thing is about this is that you can just analyze the frequency range and it will auto like uh, balance everything out so that it's all level. Yeah, it's make like a linear signal, which is quite handy uh, sometimes. And it's really easy to handle. Yeah. Now, speaking of the, I guess, the plugins of the equalizers, we have like three, four favorite ones. You can speak about this. So one is, Obviously, the the Pro Q. Uh, the, everyone just serves its purpose, right? This is like go-to equalizer. Yeah. Uh, the problem with this sometimes you just shift the face, right? You don't want to like put it on the kick, on the bass. Sometimes you just feel like shift the face, and then the, the kick on the bass sounds different. In that case, we use the other plugin. The other um, just uh, keep the uh, face linear, so it doesn't change any. Uh, doesn't have like a face uh, issues, a face shifts. It just really, it doesn't saturate the sound. So it's like keep uh, really clean. So we use like on a, on a drum bus mostly. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then last last question on the drum bus. Do you, do you tend to uh, put reverb on your drum bus? And sort of if so, what's your sort of go-to for putting reverb on your drum bus? Uh, no, we, I think we like try to like it be dry. But most of the loops already has the reverb, so I guess uh, you can have this drum shaper and just increase the sustain, which just brings all this reverb up. Mm. So I guess, um, yeah. In general, like the more clean the tops are nowadays, because uh, like sound systems are getting so good. If you play something in a club and like, usually the more precise sounds are and samples are, the better. If you have like a lot of like sustains or tails everywhere, it just makes everything feel kind of like noisy in a way, right? Yeah, and yeah. the scenes have already a lot of reverb and so much space, so uh, it, it, you have to have something dry, I guess. Uh, yeah. So that's we use the the I guess the, the percussion is quite dry in our tracks. And with all that said, is there anything that is happening with you guys? Anything big that we should look forward to? Yeah, well, we are part of uh, Tomorrowland's brand new label that they just announced. Uh, we're going to be having a brand new track coming up there very soon called All Day, All Night. It's very cool. And we also just finished a brand new remix for the man himself, Joel Corey. So that's super exciting as well. That should also come out very shortly. So keep your keep your eyes open on our Spotify, on Beatport, of course. And uh, yeah, always bring out cool, cool tracks. <laughs> it's gonna be a new release with the Sync on Swim. Uh, it's gonna be Solo Toko release uh, next month, I think, or this month. Solo Toko is coming out this month. Full release schedule for the next half year. So, and, and a lot of cool music coming. Awesome. Well, we can't wait to hear it. Thank you guys so much for joining us, and thank you guys so much for your time. Wow.